Today I'm going to share some reflections of a nurse on the experience of patients dying in my care. Years ago, I asked my mother-in-law, who was a nurse for years, if she had ever done CPR. And I remember asking with a combination of innocence and eagerness. It was, it was something out of my experience, imagining doing CPR, saving someone's life. And I asked her when I was in nursing school, and she said yes, and she didn't say much about it. That question kind of frames my view of death because my perspective has changed pretty significantly over the years um, being a nurse. I've been a nurse for over eight and a half years um, and I've seen a lot of people die. I want to share this video because I think that nurses have a really unique perspective on death and dying because we see it um, not like a family member sees it. We experience death in a professional context, but nurses are people too. And so you can't, um, you can't take away how hard it is to see people die, but we see it differently. We're not completely overcome by emotion. In fact, one of the main shifts that happened over time in seeing people die is going from being paralyzed um, to having enough exposure to death that you're able to still take action. I'm actually surprised I'm getting a little emotional talking about this and that is something that you don't you don't stop and reflect a lot. It's you know I've worked as a nurse for eight and a half years pretty much every single week. Most of them don't die. Most of them get better. That's one of the cool things about nursing is when for most of eight and a half years I have worked um, several days in a row in a week you actually um, see your assignment get easier because your patients are getting better. They get better and most of them get better and go home. The first time that someone who I was taking care of died, I didn't actually, I wasn't there when he died. And anything I say today, you know, is actually regulated under the law. There's a law called HIPAA and it, it regulates how healthcare professionals share information um, about people who they care for. It's illegal to share identifiable personal health information about a patient that you take care of. And this is a protection that we have under the law and it's a really good thing. So nothing I share today will be um, personal health information nor will it be identifiable with any individual. The first person who I cared for, who I know died, he was an example of the most healthy dying experience that I can imagine. He um, came in and had an array of symptoms. He was working in his yard or his garden just the day that he came into the hospital. And, and he just got really weak and couldn't keep going. A lot of people come to the hospital for weakness and we try to figure out why they're weak and what's going on. And um, it didn't take long we figured out that he had um, cancer th through his body. And a doctor talked to him and told him that he had probably days to live. I took care of him for about two days. And what I saw was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. This was a man who had lived a whole life, who had many, many wonderful relationships. And I watched him get on the phone for most of two days. 
And he also received visitors in his room. And he, he talked to people. And I listened to him when I was in there passing meds or checking on him. And he said his goodbyes in the most healthy way I can imagine. He, he would, he, I watched him. He would look people in the eyes or he would talk to them on the phone and he would say, I want to tell you how much you mean to me and how much I love you. It was amazing. It was amazing. This was a man who had lived many years and he knew that he just had days to, to live. I actually took him outside of the building um, another nurse and myself took him out in a wheelchair. He wanted to go outside. And we took him out, and it was, it had just rained. And it, and th there were clouds and just bright sun shining down through the clouds. And it was one of the most beautiful moments of my nursing career, very early on. And we took him out, and he just looked around, and he said, this is so beautiful. He had a real appreciation for life and had obviously lived a full, um, productive, and connected life. So that was the experience that I, for me, just reflects a, the most healthy and kind of successful end-of-life experience. And he did end up dying just days, just days after he left my care. Other people don't take dying so well. Most death experiences are not like that one. I had a guy who came in once and I don't remember what his primary complaint was, but it, in short order, we figured out what the problem was. And he, um, he had a, um, abdominal aortic aneurysm. An abdominal aortic aneurysm is like a bulge in your aorta. And your aorta is, is very important in your plumbing. It's, it's a huge um, artery that comes off the top of your heart and it goes down through your body. It supplies your whole body with blood. And this was in lower down in his abdomen. And so it's very common for people to have these aneurysms and their bulges and the doctors basically just watch them and make sure they're not changing because the risk is that they can rupture and um, that can be devastating. So what was going on with him is he was, his um, aneurysm was actively leaking and that meant um, his imminent de demise was near. And and he took it pretty well. I remember distinctly the doctor came into his room and he told him very matter of factly, he said, you will die imminently from this. He said, I can take you to the operating room and there's a possibility that I can repair this. But he told him, there's also a possibility that your aorta won't tolerate repair and it will just crumble in my hands. That's exactly what he said. And the patient thought about it and the patient, um, he said, I don't want to do the surgery. In this situation, it wasn't the patient who, um, who took this news poorly. It was his family and his family fell apart. It was a real mess. They just lost, they lost it. So I gave this gentleman um, multiple units of blood as fast as you can give blood. I had multiple bags of blood hanging at once, just pumping blood into his body because he was losing blood from his aorta into his abdominal cavity inside of him. And he was sitting here talking to me through all of this. I don't know what happened with him in the end. I would assume that if he he didn't go through the surgery that he did uh, die later in the ICU. In the first case I talked about, this was a man who just like, he was ready. He had all of his affairs in order, all of his most important affairs, his relationships. And he didn't have a whole litany of apologies or anything. He just, he just 
told the people that he knew, he just said, I love you. That's really what he said. And he, it was dozens and dozens of people. He was basically had a full-time business of saying, I love you. I appreciate you. Here's what I love about you for several days. And the, in the second case, it just, I don't know what the exact situation was, but, um, the, this gentleman's family, they were not ready to let him go. Um, and they were fighting it. There's really positive things that come from seeing people dying, like caring for the people you love, knowing that life is fragile. Those are good things, but there's also kind of a traumatic side to uh, working with people who are dying. It's very stressful because as a nurse, you are legally and I would say morally responsible for your patient's life and well-being. That is a huge responsibility. The next story about a patient dying, it's not really just one person. It's, it is many, many people who have come to the end of their life. Their health has gotten worse, usually over years and months and worse over days. And then it comes to a point, often the issue at hand is it comes to a point where an individual can't um, safely swallow anymore. And that's often a point where um, a person might choose to um, be, go under hospice care. And hospice care, it, that just means that um, usually you have a terminal diagnosis, which could be many things. Um, common ones are chronic lung disease, cancer, and it, it means that you have a prognosis of um, six months, probably that you won't outlive six months. I've taken care of these people just for a few days at a time. I don't work in hospice, but often we're transitioning people from acute care where we're working our hardest to make them better. And, and it comes to a point where either we or their families say, hey, we should consider, we should consider changing our focus. Often these individuals are participating in the decision making. I've had many people tell me, I want to stay at home. I don't want to go to the hospital anymore. I don't want to go to a nursing home. And that's a re request I think that we should honor. It's really basic care at this point. You go into their room and you check and see, you know, just first how they look overall. And you might adjust their position in the bed if they're gonna live for a few days or a few weeks, you wanna make sure they're not gonna get a pressure sore. So you might just adjust them and turn them to one side. You make sure they're dry and clean. Um, oral care is extremely important. Keeping someone's mouth moisturized and clean is really just this basic um, element of dignity that a nurse can provide. Um, the other things that we do are, we'll sometimes provide medications. Our goal is not to sedate an individual, but to provide them some comfort in their symptoms. So a big example of this is someone who has end stage COPD and they are experiencing shortness of breath or dyspnea. Like after you just sprint as far as you can that's how they feel all the time. They cannot catch their breath. And it's really a miserable feeling and often accompanied by severe anxiety because the body says, I need to breathe. And one thing that we do for those individuals is we give them morphine. We don't give them morphine to knock them out. We give them morphine because it has al alternative uses and it has a pretty dramatic effect in reducing the experience of shortness of breath. The last thing we do a lot of with 
this patient, this kind of comfort care patient, that, that's what we would call them, is we um, talk to their families. And I really enjoy this because the, the care has shifted from a lot of technicalities about treatment and the care has shifted really to the individual uh, more than ever. So I like to ask family members just questions like, what did your mom like to do? What did she do in her spare time? And they really usually they're eager to answer those questions. The last patient, um, and it's really not just one patient who I've worked with, but many, the last one is the one who we are actively trying to save and yet they slip through our fingers. We can't do it. Um, I showed up to a lot of these. Actually, I lost count. I never, I couldn't keep track of how many. There's this irony, I spoke of it earlier, that you actually have to become a little bit numb to death and the fear of death in order to function. Because the first time you walk into one of these situations, you can't, you can't even think. You can't do anything. Um, if you can jump in and do chest compressions, you're doing great. I, I was involved in a lot of codes where we were able to get people back, and that was always fulfilling. But um, quite a few folks wouldn't make it through a code. You really, it makes you think about how hard it is on you to do those high level interventions, like doing CPR on someone. Um, you might do CPR on an individual, an older individual, and their bones are um, less flexible than younger folks, and you break their ribs while you're doing CPR. When you walk in um, to a code like that, you can often tell people's respiratory status, like how well things are going by the color they are. Basically gray and blue are bad. Pink to red are pretty good. I told you, you kind of get numb in these situations. It's not numbness, it's just, it's just what you, it's the attitude and view towards that you have to have in order to function. If you imagine a situation like this, you have to view it as your job. I was never, I never, heard a joke in a code that I thought was like disrespectful to the person. It was more like someone telling a joke about like, hey, you thought you were going to um, get to eat your lunch or something, but no, you ran to this code. But you have to pad these experiences with humor. It used to really bother me. Nursing humor used to really bother me. And then I realized it's just people coping with stress. There was one experience though in a code after I'd been in it for a while, that really hit me. I'm gonna tell you about that briefly. Um, over the years, our, the perspective in critical care and in kind of this emergency level care has shifted more towards allowing families to be present. Years past, they would actually like just kick the family out. Um, just like leave, we're gonna deal with this. And it would be just medical professionals surrounding an individual. So a lot of times we'll leave the door open and the family will be right there and we'll usually have someone who just stands and talks to them one-on-one. -on -one. And it might be a chaplain, it might be like a charge nurse, it might be a social worker, whoever's there. It, it could be a CNA, anyone can jump in into this role and just like put your arm around them and say, hey, if you don't wanna be here, you don't have to be here. If you wanna go down the hall, you can. So the one experience, I ran, I ran into this code, I was doing CPR, um, a cu couple other roles. And we were just talking like we normally do. You know, you're always talking like, what med did we just give? Um, who's gonna switch to CPR next? We have an airway. Just everyone's, you're constantly talking through stuff. There's a doctor there, a bunch of nurses, a couple of respiratory therapists. And we're just doing our thing. It's actually can be very upbeat. It's the most intense teamwork effort that you've probably ever seen. So we're just, we're going through the motions. We're talking, yelling, shouting, doing what we had to do. And I remember, um, the code ended. We said, hey, we, like, we can't. Um, we're not making any progress. We're not getting a heart rhythm back. So we ended up calling it at the end. 
And I remember walking out of that room, like feeling like we'd done our best, but, and not really personally sad, but I turned around and there was this patient's spouse sitting in a chair in the hall, watching everything. And that, I cried, honestly, that made, that hit me really hard. Um, just imagining what they saw in what we did. And I guess my consolation is in that is that um, they knew that we did everything that we could. Um, the last situation of someone dying that I'll, I'll share with you is it's really one of the saddest. Um, and that is a patient who we'd coded a bunch of times. That means we done, they've gone through a series of CPR multiple times. I've been down to where he was. And um, in those situations, like you're, you can't make decisions for yourself. You've got a breathing tube, you're on a ventilator after you've been coded and uh, you're sedated, sometimes paralyzed. They couldn't contact this man's family. I don't think he had any family. This, like I said, this is probably the saddest thing that I've ever seen um, in my nursing career. They finally got the guy's friend on the phone. And there's kind of a complicated like order of legal precedence in decision making on medical decisions if no one's been legally designated. Uh, it starts with your spouse. I think it's like kids would make decisions for you next. I think siblings are next. I actually don't know it all. I don't have to. But we couldn't find any of those family members. And, and so the person who ended up being legally responsible to make this guy's decision was his, his buddy. It was his best friend. He didn't have any family. So they finally got him on the phone. They called him in. And I just remember the doctors explaining to this guy, like, look, we cannot fix this. We've done CPR over and over and over. We've probably broken his ribs. He's not going to recover from this. Like, we have him on this huge array of medical equipment. Like, when are we going to stop? I just remember the look on that guy's face because I don't think he knew, like, that he would make, be making those decisions. It made me so sad because this was, I mean, this was a gentleman who did not have family. One of the saddest things I've ever seen. I guess when I reflect on just the overall arc of my nursing career in relation to death, uh, first of all, there's been a lot of it. It's, I would say a pretty significant exposure to death. Um, it's, there's a lot of good effects. Like, I feel like it's deepened who I am and my view of the world. Um, but it's also, it's also traumatic, honestly. I think that's something in the nursing world that's kind of under reported and undercovered is just, it's, there's like a traumatic level of stress and just going to work and having the responsibility of people's lives on you. I don't regret becoming a nurse at all. And actually I love meeting my patients um, every morning. And I like, I like figuring out like, hey, how can I help you get through this system? You don't want to be here. You don't understand some of the stuff that's happening around you. You're like, what's going on? When is the doctor going to see me? I often can answer those questions. Um, and if I can't answer them, I can at least find someone who has the answer, get you through your day and help you to not be so afraid. So that's some of my experience with death. I hope that was helpful to somebody or at least you enjoyed just hearing more of what it's like to be a nurse um, around people who are extremely ill and dying. Okay, thanks. Have a great day.